So we are well into the month of Kartik, our holy month. And um, as such, I wanted to explore and look at some of the themes of this month, um, which are sacred to our whole tribe and have been for many thousands of years. Um, I guess we can just start with a simple observation. Um, we're in autumn. Um, and so in Sanskrit, we're in the Sharad season, the autumn season. After the monsoons, and the earth, which is semi-desiccated in the hot months in India, gets, gets brought back to life with the monsoon season, which itself is, is somewhat tumultuous. The monsoon season is, um, travel is very difficult in the subcontinent of India. And people generally, traditionally, they parked in one place and lived in one place for the four months of the rainy season, the Chatur Mas, we're just at the end, of, tail end of that. And so um, we have this four month period, it's raining, the earth prior to that time was, you know, it's, it's quite common in Vrindavan, for instance, one of our holy places, it gets up to maybe 115 degrees every summer. And that's not, you know, records, then you're in the Death Valley, 125. But to get up to 50 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 118 degrees Celsius, happens. Most years it gets that hot. And then the monsoons come, and everything is just um, brought back to life. And uh, um, it's really like a, almost like a, like a gift from heaven. It gets so hot in India. Who's ever lived through the summer months in India? Raise your hand if you've ever spent a full summer in India. It gets, it gets so hot, you don't even go anywhere. I mean, if you have air conditioning, it's a whole different story. If you have air conditioning, then it's like living in Dubai or anywhere else where it's ungodly hot outside, but you just stay indoors all the time. But raise your hand if you've ever lived through the hot season in India without any air conditioning. Yeah, it's, it's no joke. You get a heat rash, and you can't really move during the day. And even at night, I don't know about all of you, but I would take a, a cloth and dunk it in a bucket of water and then put it over my body and then turn the fan on. And then uh, within maybe 20 minutes, that cough, because you pass the, it's called a swamp cooler. It's an old form of air conditioning where you, you take water and you blow a fan through water and by blowing a fan through water, it then cools down the air. Not tremendously, it's not like you're gonna go from 90 degrees or 100 degrees to 60 or 70, but you'll get a good 10 degrees coolness out of it. So a primitive version of a swamp core is you dip a towel in water, you lay it over your body, and then you lay under a fan. You ever do that? And it cools you down. Right. And then, but then within, you know, I don't know, half an hour, max, maybe 20 minutes, the cloth has become totally dry and so you like the whole night you're dunking your cloth and putting it over you and dunking your cloth and putting it over you. Sometimes you'll have a room dug into the backyard of your house, like a cellar that's in the earth and then that gets a little cooler. You can do that too, that works. Um, but it's, it's so hot that you can't really do anything during the day. And it, everything sort of comes to life in the evening time for a few hours. 
but during the daytime itself, it's, it's just it's too hot. Um, and then things get dry and desiccated, and there's this whole like desertification thing that goes on where you, you're practically speaking living in a desert. And then also you get heat rashes. Raise your hand if you ever had a heat rash. It's hellish. It's like you break out in a, a rash, like hives, just caused from the heat. And all of a sudden, it's just gone. And people are pouring buckets of water on you wherever you walk. The, the, the monsoon season in India is not like a heavy rain. It's almost like there's a person above you pouring a bucket of water on your head. And you walk outside and it's just, they're just following you around. You know, like, a, like an angel or a leprechaun following you around. And they're just constantly pouring a bucket of water on your head. And the, the temperature immediately drops about 20 degrees. And then there's this whole other thing which happens where everything becomes insanely humid. Which is its own, like, its own, you know, troublesome phenomenon as well. Um, and there's, there's also mosquitoes that come at a certain point. Not when it's really heavily raining. The water has to sit for a little while, but the mosquitoes come. It's a whole, there's a whole Pandora's box full of things that happen. But the monsoon season isn't just like jumping into a cool lake and then everything's better. It's got its own thing going on with the humidity, with the flooding. Um, And, and, and so it takes a few months for this all to get worked out. And then autumn happens. And in autumn, the rivers and the lakes are full. The water's settled. And everything gets really nice. It's one of the most pleasant times of the year to be in India, is during this autumn slash early winter season. And so as harvesting goes on during this time of the year all over the world, and you have your harvest moon, and um, you're collecting bounty from the earth, then everywhere in the world, whether you're in China and you're doing a mid-autumn festival, or you're in the US and you observe Thanksgiving, there's this universal phenomenon that in the autumn time people become grateful and thankful for what the earth has given them and they have festivals of thanksgiving where they give back and that can be secular breaking bread with your members of your community or with other communities a lot of times, Thanksgiving, people will go out and they'll um, feed the homeless or something like that. Or if you're in a religious tradition, then that Thanksgiving extends to divinity as well. And you give thanks to God for the bounty that's going to sustain you through the winter time. This is almost universal. You find this in all cultures, old and new, and even small secularized remnants like Thanksgiving in the U.S. are uh, homages or slight nods to these older traditions. So Kartik is that, and we give thanks. But because we are a spiritual tradition, then the thanks that we give our for our revelation for the things in our tradition that we hold to be most sacred and most dear. And so this month is, is dedicated to that. And it's part of the four months, but it's the tail end. And things have sort of settled down. And the earth is pleasant. And the transition period of the monsoon has ended. And the earth is filled with water, and it's cool, and the days are not too long, and they're not too short because you're in this autumn equinox phase where the day and night are 
equal parts, just like in the spring equinox or the vernal equinox in, the, in March, April. So you also have the autumn equinox that uh, takes place in October, November. And you've got this real nice moment where you can press pause and give thanks. And when it's too sunny out, I mean, it's, it's too sunny out and sometimes it's just depressive, but then there's also, it's too sunny out and you want to enjoy too much. Like if you have a more mild climate, like in Southern California, the long days of summer aren't oppressively hot. They're incredibly pleasant. And then two people are too busy enjoying to really give thanks. And winter, along with famine and cold and, and austerity and suffering and death and, and things like that that's associated with, um, along with the night. Winter is also a time that's associated with being pensive and thoughtful and deep and profound and thinking about higher topics. And the reason for that is that it's not so seductively pleasant outside that you just get sucked into an unbridled enjoyment, but rather the uh, austere climate and the limitations that are placed on you because the nights are long and the days are short and the coldness, it makes you more go a little more internal. People usually put on a little bit of fat during the winter time. They're more sedentary during the winter time. And in a traditional culture, or in a thoughtful culture, they, they become more thoughtful during that time. It becomes a time of awakening, really, for deep thought and, and, and journaling and introspection and such. And so it's almost like the autumn is just touching into that. And so it gives you a time to be a little more thoughtful and a little more considerate and a little deeper. Anyway, that's a little bit about the, this time of year and what it means to people. And so then for us specifically, this is a time where we give thanks. And we give thanks for our conception of divinity. Now, you can, you can say, you know, what's the value of religion? I remember I was talking to a friend of mine who is a psychiatrist and he's the head of the psychiatric department at UCLA, or at least he was for several decades. And he was also a working psychiatrist. And he was my next door neighbor growing up, and I was best friends with his son. His son's name was Jeremy. So Jeremy and I were best friends growing up. Jeremy was one year older than me, two years young, younger than my older brother, and we were kind of a, like a, um, a little rascals type crew. We hung out and did everything together. Um, so anyway, I was uh, it was Christmas actually. I don't know, 25 years ago or something like that. And they, this family, the Haas family, they're Jewish. And so on Christmas they would come next door and they would hang out with us on Christmas. And so I would always go up to my parents' house on Christmas and spend Christmas with them. And then the Haas family would always come and we'd have a little extended family, village type reunion in the afternoon. And so uh, Neil, the, the father, um, came over and we were talking. We were talking about religion because I'm a priest and so that, you know, just naturally as we were talking, the conversation segued into that. And he was trying to explain to me how the real value of religion is that it gives people something that they have in common with one another. And it provides a focal point for a community. And it's a shared experience and a shared value system. And, and uh, that's important to have in life. And so that's the real reason why religion has value. And my response to him was to say, yeah. And so like, you know, anything that provides that 
is just as valuable as religion. He said, yeah, you've understood me, yes. And I said, right, just like Nazism was you know, a thing that people had in common, that brought a community together, that became a focal point, that rallied and motivated people to act and became a shared experience that a lot of people participated in. I mean, he was smart. He had a PhD. He was like a super rich psychiatrist. I made that statement to him, and he just, he was already pale, but whatever little bit of blood was in his face drained out of his face, and he just you know, looked at me kind of stone-faced and said, all right, and then I, okay, I got it. And I made the counterpoint to him. I said, the real value of a religion, Neil, and of course, this is funny because I'd known Neil since I was three years old. That's when my, how old my family was when we moved there. So Neil grew up with me, and it must have been an unpleasant experience for him that he knew me when, literally when I was still in diapers. And, you know, sucking my thumb and wetting the bed. And then here I am telling him what time it is at a family gathering in front of everybody. Um, I said to him, I said, Neil, the, the, the value of religion is it's a, a given religion's unique conception of divinity and the beautiful ideas they have about the nature of divinity. That's what's special about a religion or a spiritual tradition. If you don't like the word religion. That's what's unique about religion, that it has in common with nothing else in the world. And certainly, there's subsidiary benefits, there's secondary benefits, there's other auxiliary benefits, such as it brings people together and you have drama and dance and music and artwork and, uh, um, and, and uh, a shared experience and... and there's, there's all sorts of other benefits that any social group will have, and then because religion is also a social group and a special interest group, it will also share those things in common. So I don't, I don't dismiss that. I'm, I don't dispute that. I'm willing to um, uh, uh, agree to that, stipulate to that, no problem. But where a spiritual tradition is a unique phenomenon within human culture, and where it does something that no other special interest group does, where it does something that no other special interest group does, and where it tackles or deals with or explores and considers something that's unique, that, that, that there's, there's no other grouping of humans on any level that does this. Because if a group of humans do start to tackle big questions like who am I and why am I here and what's God, then guess what they just became? Guess what you call that special interest group? If you, have a spe just if you want to see the obviousness of the point I'm making, in case it's not totally clear, imagine a special interest group, any special interest group, anywhere in the world at any time. And that special interest group is not a religion. They're just a special interest group that thinks about the nature of God and comes up with and answers questions about a conception of divinity and what's the nature and the, and the, the, the visage and the likeness of God and, and what are God's desires for the world and what's God's interaction with humanity. And it's, it's not a religion. It's a special interest group that just happened to stumble upon and deal with those questions. What would you call such a special interest group? I'm now worried that all of you guys are... Religion. Huh? Religion. Exactly. And that's the proof that that's what makes a spiritual tradition unique. What, what the essence of it is. What differentiates it from other things. There's also sometimes value in what it has in common with other groups. But a real full definition has to be the whole truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. You have to say what something is and also what it's not. And you have to get a real crystallized mutually exclusive, comprehensively exhaustive definition, where you look at all the things that make up a group, but you also distill those things, and you come up with what makes that group special. And so what is a religion? A religion is a concept 
of God. Ultimately, it's a concept of God, the world, and you. A concept of you is a concept of self. Who are we? But other philosophies may do that. It's a concept of the world. Actually, let's do the world. It's like, it's like a triangle. So a concept of self, a concept of the world, any philosophy could deal with those. But as soon as you introduce the last one, the concept of God, which is the source of self and world, and creates the triangle. Once you introduce that last concept, you are now no longer a philosophy, you are a theology. You're a theistic tradition. You're a religion. You're a spiritual tradition. Therefore, that's what makes a tradition special. And just like every other tradition, that's what makes our tradition special. And comparative religions, where you compare and contrast and look at different possible answers to these questions in some kind of a, a rigorous way, where you don't assume everybody believes what you believe. That's called a plausibility structure. It makes sense to me, and therefore I assume the rest of the world thinks about the world the way I do. It's why you say if you learn another language, you learn your own. Because let's say you learn Spanish, and you learn that in Spanish, you have a whole way of conjugating verbs that is respectful and formal. Como esta usted? No. No, unless you're being super formal. Super duper formal. Like insanely formal. But at least you have como esta. Que esta haciendo? Que usted esta haciendo? You might, you have ways of saying to people, respectfully conjugating verbs, so that you're talking to people that you're not super close and familial with. And then you have a way of talking to your friends that's more, more familiar. ¿Qué está haciendo? ¿Estás haciendo? ¿Cómo estás? How are you, my friend? Imagine that in English we don't do that. We have to use honorifics when we want to commit, convey formality. There is no way to change the way you conjugate verbs in order to convey formality. If you want to convey formality, you can do so in the English language, but you do so by adding pronouns and honorifics and things like that. But when you learn another language and you learn, wow, they have this respectful way of talking and this more familial, familiar, lighthearted, playful, disporting yourself on equal terms with your friends, way of conjugating verbs, all verbs. then you learn something about your own language and your own culture. And so oftentimes by learning another language or another culture, you learn what's specific to yours because until you got a counterpoint or a contrast, you just assume that every other language, every other culture would be more or less equivalent to your own. And when you find they have words you don't even have in your language or they don't have words that you have in your language. I got a classic example of this. is The... Uh, story that gets told on social media where someone was meeting the Sioux Indians and they said, you know, they were trying to talk about what they're thinking about and they were pointing their head like what I'm thinking about and the person looked at them concerned and they said, no, no, if you, if you think here, then you're crazy. You have to think here. So probably somebody just made that up in the 60s or 70s and then attributed it to some ancient Indian tribe for, you know, to give it some sort of um, validity and some kind of uh, um, uh, authenticity, some pseudo-authenticity. But this idea, do you think with your head or do you think with your heart? Or do you have a one word for platonic love and another word for romantic love, or you just use one word for both? These things which are common in other languages, agape and eros, or other words like philia, in Greek, many, many different words for love. Um, versus just one word, like love in English. It has to be used in a variety of ways. It's context dependent. And you have to be able to recognize when people are saying, I'm loving my meal. And they're saying, I'm loving my spouse. And that those are two different types of love. You just have to work that out by looking at the context. When you learn other languages, and you learn other religions, and you learn other value systems, 
in many ways you start to learn your own because you have a contrast point. Prior to that, you have what's called a plausibility structure where you just assume that more or less everybody in the world looks at the world the way you do. So what makes us special? What makes us special is that we think, we think, our conception of divinity, which is what we're celebrating this month, our conception of divinity is that you can relate to God in one of two ways. You can have a fear-based relationship with God, where you are afraid of God. And that's everybody. If you're not afraid of God, you don't believe in God. But if you believe in God and you do wrong things, then somewhere in the recesses of your mind, there's a fear that you may be punished for doing things wrong. So you can have a fear-based relationship with God. Or you can have a love-based relationship with God. And those represent two major arcs of how you think about the deity. God's power generates fear. God's goodness generates love. Which one's better? Which one's better? Huh? Love's better. If you just focus on God's goodness, but God's impotent but good, then God's no longer God. An impotent but really good deity can't help you. It's an artificial dichotomy. Ultimately, you have to understand God's power and God's goodness, both, because both things are critical, necessary ingredients in the deity. And so God's power is what makes grace a real thing, is what makes divine assistance possible, It what makes miracles happen. And God's goodness is what makes that all-powerful deity not just be a dangerous monster. When you focus more on the goodness of God, fear begins to dissipate. And you're motivated by love. Love's a much more powerful catalyst, like an exponential curve. It starts off kind of slow, but then it peaks really, really good at the end. And so love is a motivator, devoid of fear, love and trust for divinity instead of fear of God's power and wanting to supplicate and appease God so you don't get smited or smoted. This is a much healthier, in our tradition's opinion, way of relating to the deity. Now even within the loving relationship, we've got another flavor choice like chocolate and vanilla. We have two flavors to choose from. So within the universe of love, there is formal love and there's intimate love. Formal love is respectful and there's encoded within that formality an awareness of the greatness of the personality that you love. Therefore, there's a hegemony, there's a natural power differential between you and God and you look at God as being your parent, as being your mother and father, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And so this idea of God as the father of the universe or the mother of the universe, this exists within a a fear-based relationship. It also can exist within a love-based relationship because certainly you can love your parents. But there is an awareness that they are providers. They are your protectors. They are your providers. They look after you. And you should be grateful to them for all that they've done for you. You follow this? You can contrast that idea with an intimate conception of divinity. An intimate conception of divinity doesn't worry so much about what's been done for you. It doesn't focus on power differentials. Because intimacy can't exist if there's too much of a difference. You have to be equal with the person that you love intimately. 
the very nature of intimate love is it's equal. It stops keeping track. It loves just because. In the words of Thomas Aquinas, it's love is when you, you, uh, uh, you will the other to good. You will goodness for the other. You want what's best for the other person. You wish them all the best. That's Aquinas' idea about love, which traces back to Aristotle, and, and it's an old Greek uh, idea about the, the selfless nature of love and the benevolent and ultimately the divineness of love because it participates in the goodness of the deity and it's you expressing God ultimately what's God's emotion towards all creation. Um, towards one another. So, uh, love can exist from a junior to a senior. Love can exist from a senior to a junior, no doubt. It's not that that relationship must be fear-based. For instance, imagine a small child who just trusts their parent implicitly and has no fear of their parent and has full faith in their parent as their protector, as their maintainer. And they appreciate. Oh, I, I, you know, why do you love your mother? Because oh, she always feeds me. She always cares for me. Why do you love your father? He always you know, plays with me, or takes care of me. Arguably, that's not love. Arguably, that's addiction and infatuation and attachment. Because in that person's association as an attachment figure, you get a massive download of dopamine and oxytocin and other neurotransmitters. And it makes you feel good about yourself. And so when your love is based on what the other person's doing for you and how they make you feel, what you're really doing is you're describing an addictive relationship with a person and how they meet certain biochemical needs for you. Do you follow that? So it says, oh, I, I love this person. Why? Because of the way they make me feel about myself, what they do for me. For many people in the world, for, like, for whole cultures, such a statement would be obscene. And it would be the proof that that person didn't even understand what love was. They were misusing the term. They were adulterating the term. It's, 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 it's amazing how... Uh, Normative. Such a statement would be in the modern day. Imagine saying to you know somebody, you know, why do you love your spouse? Why do you, why, why, you know, why do you love your significant other? Oh, they make me feel so good about myself. They do things for me. I, I, I feel so good when I'm around them. Would that be a normal answer you might hear? Sure, it is. It's very common. It's a very common answer. Have you ever heard such an answer? You might have even given such an answer. Millions of people, hundreds of millions of people, billions of people would be astounded at your misunderstanding of the basic nature of love, at your adulteration of what is ultimately a sacred term. Because love is to will good for the other, independent of what they do for you. It's, a, it's selfless. It's profound. It's deep. It's about them. It's not about you. So, you, I mean, if you look at the Lord's Prayer from this lens, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. You follow? If you look at standard prayers for close to half the world's population, and you, you use this lens to look at them, they fall short because you're thanking God for what he does for you. And you're not even a good American. Uh, JFK said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. It's a very famous speech. Um, you don't even 
measure up to what it means to be a good American in the 60s if that's your definition of love. So there's formal love which is based on God being big and you being small and God doing things for you and you getting something out of it and then in gratitude for what's being given you offer some love and devotion in reciprocity because you're pious and you know how to give back and you're not merely a taker. But the origin of your love is the things you have been given from above. And therefore, it's necessary to maintain a very strong conception of God's power. Therefore, it's power and goodness. Goodness wins the day, therefore it's love-based instead of fear-based. But it's goodness and there's still a lot of power in there and so there's still a big sense of What's in it for me? You following this? There's another option. The other option is that you love God intimately. And to love God intimately, you can't think of God as being bigger than you. You have to consider you and the deity to be equal. Not that you actually become equal to Krishna. But you have to think of Krishna in some sort of divine madness as being equivalent to you so that you stop asking Krishna for stuff and you start loving Krishna just because and not because of what he does for you. So on one hand you have a love-based or a fear-based tradition. Love is based on goodness, fear is based on power. Ultimately you have to have both conceptions because God's just really good but isn't powerful, and you wind up with a, um, an impotent but benign personality. Then once you lean into the love-based relationship, there's love which is formal, which is still based largely on what's in it for me, but I'm grateful for it. And then there's the other option, and the other option is it's intimate and it's not based on getting anything out of the relationship. And to make that work, you have to start thinking of God as being your equal. Or, you can go even further than equality. You can look at God as being your junior, beneath you, less than you. So instead of looking at God as being your parent, who is then giving you everything you need, our Father, give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our trespasses, you start looking at God as your child, and you don't ask what Krishna can do for you. You start thinking about what you can do for Krishna and you stop thinking entirely about getting anything for yourself. Love versus fear. Intimate love versus formal love once you choose love. That's Krishna. We worship Krishna not as your parents. Krishna has children. We don't think about them very often. We're way more interested in Krishna's friends and his parents. We're way more interested in becoming Krishna's friends or Krishna's parents. We're way less interested in becoming Krishna's children. We may, in fact, be Krishna's children. We are, in fact, Krishna's children. Krishna is the mother and father of the universe. But we don't think like that. We think about being Krishna's friend or even Krishna's parents. And in fact, this whole month is designed to help someone cultivate and appreciate the uncommon brilliance in thinking of God as your child. Not as your parent. The otherworldly, uncommon, revelatory brilliance in that subversive and anachronistic and really uh, challenging and exotic and otherworldly idea. I don't think of God as my parent because then I'm just thinking about what they're doing for me. I think of God as my child and then I can will good for the other and do things for Krishna and not expect anything in return. Be selfless in my devotion.
And in fact, that is the month. This month is called the month of Damodar. And the deity that's worshipped this month is Damodar. It's the form of baby Krishna that's controlled by his mother's love. That's bound by his mother's love. Dhamma Udara. Bound around his abdomen by his, the rope of his mother's love. Tethering him to her. Locking him into her heart. Yashoda never thinks that Krishna is God. If in heaven the angel Yashoda looks into the mouth of Krishna and sees herself looking into the mouth of Krishna in his mouth because the whole universe is within Krishna's mouth within Krishna and she sees herself and herself looking into Krishna's mouth and like a, almost like a, you know whatever that is that, that effect that where it's a huh? A recursive effect. that recursive effect thank you and she sees that she thinks oh it must be hot out it must be the summertime the sun must be hot I must have some heat stroke I should sit down but the idea that Krishna's God cannot occur in Yashoda because she's literally made of intimate love and the nature of intimate love is formality cannot exist there. And so when Krishna occasionally manifests in his divine pastimes symptoms of his Bhagavatva, of his divinity, of his power, she just shakes it off as being the sun's too hot or she's having a faint spell. And so within these pastimes, these pious stories, these sacred narrations that we rejoice and think about and sing about this month, in fact, we'll be singing about it in 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Within these songs, there's a core idea. And the core idea is that you should love and not fear God. And then within that love, you should feel a, an intimate love, a cultivated intimate love, instead of a formal love. And a formal love is still based on power. But an intimate love transcends that altogether. And from an intimate love is my goal perspective, you can no longer worship God as your parent. Because that locks you into gratitude for things given and a power differential. Rather, you must worship God as your lover, as your friend, or as your child. And in fact, when you look at our iconography, and you look at our ritual, and you look at our nomenclature, and you look at our poetry, you find this is precisely what our tradition is doing. They're flipping the script based on these critical points of what's the best way to love God, what's the most selfless way to love God, what's the most beautiful way to love God. I see it. What's the most beautiful way to love God? And they're using that and they're exploring that and all the exotic and unusual and specific and unique features of our tradition are explainable by understanding these simple points. Yes, Jagannathji. Would it be safe to say that Krishna's greatest devotees might be acutely aware of his position? Philosophically, nothing's lost on them, but they'll even make that conscious decision to, to ignore them. In lieu of the higher... This is a subject which gets dealt with quite exhaustively in our tradition because it's such an important point. Our poets and theologians write about this elaborately. Now, if you are in this world, if you're in this world and you're looking up at that world, then there will always be present to some extent an awareness of God's divinity. When you step out of this world, into that world, 
even if it's just with one foot, if you make it to Vrindavan, then in Vrindavan, nobody thinks of Krishna as being God. That's, it. That's gone. And that can be one foot in this world and one foot in that world. Within the Leela, within the Vrindavan Leela, Krishna's divinity is absent, holy. In Mathura or Dwarka, there is some scope, what to speak of Ayodhya. There's a real mixing. But in Vrindavan, the Brijbasis, they never think of Krishna as being God. And in fact, when some sadhu comes there, like a Gargarishi or a Narad Muni, and tries to explain to them that Krishna's God, they just, I can't quite hear it. They're like, oh yeah, it's very good my son has become God. Yeah, it's very good. Like the, the, my son is the critical feature. Once you cross over into Mathura to a Devaki uh, Vasudev situation, they understand that God has become my son. And they understand that there's a divine pastime and that he is the Supreme Lord. But the transition across the Yamuna in the Vrindavan is the forgetfulness of this and that is why Yoga Maya is ever present in Vrindavan and she is the ubiquitous basic feature of Vrindavan because everybody's in Maya and it's the Maya that allows for them to have a union, a yoga with Krishna in a very intimate way. Now, our theologians take it even further and they say that Krishna also forgets he's God in Vrindavan. Because if Krishna was remembering he was God, then he would be incapable of intimate love because he'd always be thinking about how he was greater than us. And so not only do the devotees lose their conception of Krishna's greatness, but Krishna himself forgets, except for when his devotees are in danger. And now there's this like deep, unconscious, id-like, to use the Freudian theory, an almost id-like, deep, unconscious impulse that we have forever, even in Vrindavan, to run towards Krishna and be Krishna unmukha and to take shelter of Krishna, which is why when Kaliya Naga creates some difficulty or when Indra is creating some difficulty with the Samvarta clouds, everyone runs to Krishna for shelter because it's just natural that we're always moving towards Krishna. And when there's an emergency, the devotees will just cry out, Krishna, save us. Not even knowing why, it's just an impulse. And in that exact moment, Krishna's divinity will pour out and he'll become aware of his own divinity solely to save and protect his devotees. And in the moment that emergency is averted, Krishna re-forgets he's God and the devotees do too, which is why you see when Krishna's holding up Govardhan Hill, the cowherd men have their sticks and they're holding it up for Krishna, thinking Krishna is such a small boy, he cannot hold this hill. We are big, powerful men. We will hold up the hill. Krishna, you can go and sit down. You are not needed anymore. When they were dying, Krishna, please save us. But the moment they were saved, immediately they revert back to this conception. And so Vrindavan has both the uh, Sarvagita and the Mugdata features the, the Krishna is bewildered and all knowing and he's all powerful and all sweet but the sweetness manifests very very prominently and the power and the knowledge only manifests in emergency situations showing us in this world what's really going on but in that world they don't even notice it it's just kind of like it's a little moment of forgetfulness a little blind spot in their system. And so, what you said, I like a lot from this world looking up at that world. Once you step into that world, then some of that is lost. The very act of stepping into that world is precisely the losing of that conception. And so what happens in this world is you appreciate these ideas and you enshrine these ideas in your heart. And you think, I would like to love Krishna the way Yashoda loves Krishna. I would like to follow in the footsteps of Yashoda Mai. 
I would like to love Krishna like the gopis love Krishna. I'd like to follow in the footsteps of the mandris. I'd like to follow in the footsteps of Sri Dhamma. And you worship that ideal as you step into those pastimes, then you worship that ideal, but you make it your own. And it becomes less something you look up to and more something that becomes a part of you. So yeah, what makes a tradition special? Their conception of divinity. What's our conception of divinity? Love trumps fear. Intimate love trumps formal love. And intimate love means you have to stop thinking of superior and inferior. It no longer works. And our entire tradition is a profound, poetic, dramatic, artful, musical exploration of precisely these points. And with these few ideas really imbibed and really understood, our entire tradition with all of its bells and whistles and all of its minutia and of all its very, very exotic and almost like impenetrable facets that just almost seem to like defy any ability for a Westerner to climb into because they're so wholly Indian and village Indian. And it's just so unbelievably exotic. It almost just makes, it's almost impenetrable for a foreigner. All these ideas immediately open up to you. And you can appreciate them and there's a method of the madness, and there's a beauty to it, and it's like, uh, uh, there's this elegance within the madness, and there's this calm within the storm, and there's this steady theme of continuity between all the different variegated manifestations of it, and you can see it, and it's really easy to appreciate. Thank you very much. Let's do a look here, Tom.